Okay, thanks. So up next is John Chelsom, um, using uh, the Exist XML database and dealing with uh, big data. So please okay. take it away. Well, uh, thank you, Charles. It's a long time since I attended even um, yes, Lynn speak at a XML conference over 10 years. And in fact, I was reminded by, Di by Diane Kennedy that um, the first, well, not by her, but I was thinking and then reminded uh, that um, the first time I went to an SGML conference, it took me a couple of days to work out uh, what Charles meant, which was everyone was talking about Charles, which I thought was the system mm -hmm. that somebody made maybe like a confederated hierarchical aggregated <laughs> relational linked entity system. <laughs> anyway, it's amused me sitting at the back this morning that there's a new Charles has come along. And so, um, isn't that interesting? No, probably not. Anyway, uh, um, so I, my name is John Chelson, and I'm going to talk about some experiments I've been running, uh, making, or trying to make native open source native XML databases scale up. Uh, I'm talking to you about, a, a, this is all done with a system called CityHR, which is a health record system. So the domain's healthcare, but of course it's um, applicable, the facts in healthcare is um, slightly by the by from a technical point of view. Um, so why uh, have I decided to do this or try, trying to make this? I'll give you some background in a second to the uh, application specifically in healthcare, but um, you've probably started to notice if you're not in this field, the headlines about personalized medicine, which is uh, a branch of medicine which is revolutionizing treatments, particularly in cancer uh, treatments, but also uh, other conditions like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, et cetera, which are treatments based on uh, working out from the human genome, the specific DNA, irregularities uh, in a particular patient which have led to whatever conditions so that drugs can target specifically the, uh, the defects in that individual patient. Um, and it's getting quite spectacular in terms of the results, particularly I think this week or maybe even today, uh, headlines about increases in uh, treating prostate cancer. Um, it's quite spectacular, but the research behind doing this uh, has a lot of stuff on the uh, uh, medical side in terms of the drug development and the ge ge genomics, the, the analyzing DNA. Um, but to go with that, you also need a large volume of clinical data so that you can match the DNA irregularities with particular clinical uh, observations in a large set of patients. So uh, that requires gathering during routine clinical care, highly structured data, and then uh, analyzing it at big data scale. Um, and surprise, surprise, XML provides a perfect way to hold structured data in healthcare for a number of reasons, but the main one being is that healthcare data is structured, but each type of data in healthcare is structured to a more or less degree. So you get diagnostic images, for example, which aren't structured at all, they're just pictures, but they have metadata with a bit of structure. Um, and then you have highly structured uh, things like lab results with a lot of structure in them. Um, but a lot of data in healthcare is just written by clinicians in the form of no clinic notes or letters and things which have some structure, but not a lot. So have a range of structure and XML is ideal because it can represent that whole range of structure. And there's a couple of standard ways to do that now. There's the thing called Health Level 7 Clinical Document Architecture and the European base standards, international standard now, ISO 13606 for how uh, health records are represented and particularly uh, in HL7 CDA, how they're represented in, in XML. So that's a bit of background. Um, so why am I doing this? Well, um, I used to run a company which had a health record system. Um, and uh, I'll show you that in a second. Um, in this country, 
we started in 2003 trying to build a big data system, so more than 10 years ago, um, to scale up to 55 million patients, and that was splitting the country of England into five regions, which uh, the largest of which had about 12 million patients, or population. Um, and if, you're, uh, if you go to a very large uh, acute hospital, then the natural, what we call a natural community of, of patients, the largest you'll come across is probably about one and a half million patients. So for example, a hospital network in Oxford, where I live, centered on the university hospital now in, in Oxford, ha has a, a population coverage of about a million and a half uh, patients. So the, uh, needless to say, the, the major NHS uh, revolutionized the uh, health records was a complete and unmitigated disaster um, and it all sort of well it didn't actually blow up it slowly got worse and worse and then withered with and uh, with uh, questions in parliament and committees and analysis and etc etc so so pretty much a disaster um, and partly as a result of that I and uh, not just me but many people started thinking there must be a better way to do this and there's lots of better ways to do lots of parts of that program but from the technology point of view I started looking at making open source uh, solutions and having everything open rather than some of the disasters we had previously um, and I've just reached the scale well, the stage where I'm wondering can I now take what we have as open source and do what was intended uh, uh, 10 or so years ago so can we take open source native XML databases and scale them up to, to that sort of size. So here's the system we used to have. Uh, it was introduced in 1999. Uh, it was the first uh, XML based EHR product, certainly in the UK and possibly in the world. Um, it used uh, XML, but it used its own flavors of XML so not standard uh, flavors of XML, and it used a, um, a relational database. Um, in fact, it's still running amazingly in Oxford after 17 odd years, which is quite a feat for any IT system. Um, and I think that's the only place it's still running now, but it's still, still going. Uh, in 2003, it was chosen to be the sort of underpinning clinical system for this disastrous IT project across England. Um, so one of the interesting things that we did at the start of that was to ramp this thing up, which had previously, uh, well, it was running in Oxford, so with running with potentially a million and a half patients, um, and see if it scaled up to 55 million. Uh, and to do that, in piled BT, and Logica CMG as systems integrators and armies of people from Oracle and uh, Sun Microsystems as there were separate companies um, and started building a massive clustered Oracle database with hardware accelerators for Java. I didn't uh, until then even know such things existed uh, and trying to get this thing as big as possible uh, and they did it. Um, and that cost, just the infrastructure for that cost several hundreds of millions of pounds. The total contract uh, to do this was over a billion pounds. Um, so they spent hundreds of millions on just the infrastructure, so the hardware and the kit to get, the, get this going. So if we take that, come back to this in a minute, uh, bottom, at the bottom there, inf infrastructure cost was, was more than five pounds per patient uh, to uh, to make to make this thing, um, and it was it was um, if you're a technologist, it was fascinating to watch these people saying, "Well, we could tweak a bit a bit of extra time if we put that Java actually on the chip there and got got Intel to do something." Uh, it was way beyond what I was uh, familiar with then, but it, but uh, but some um, very interesting. So to so, sort of back down to earth uh, about. Um, six years ago, five years, five years ago, five years ago, I started making an open source version of essentially that's K 
case notes system. Um, uh, and it's got quite a few fundamental differences. It's an enterprise scale and it's a Java, enterprise Java system, same. Um, doesn't have any of my or anybody else's Java code in other than the glue together of the open source systems that it uses. All the code for CityHR is written with XML. Um, it's a XRX application, uses XForms, REST for uh, uh, calls, uh, APIs, and uh, XQuery for the database. So it's a bit of glue. Um, using XML and XSRT and all the things that are there, sitting on top of a collection of um, open source components, including most notably today, the exist uh, native XML database and Orbion Forms, which is a X Forms and XML pipeline processing platform. Uh, I almost didn't put this slide in, I'm glad I did, because it's very similar to actually the presentation we just listened to in the sense that uh, the way that the city HR clinical systems are built, it starts with a quite a small uh, architecture, which is a set of building blocks, which are created as a, an ontology using web ontology language OWL. And it's quite a small set of building blocks. Um, and then for each particular application, whether it's in rheumatology or fracture liaison or diabetes, whatever it is, um, the clinicians build their own information models of the information that they want to gather. And it's uh, important that clinicians do that themselves because only they know uh, which detailed data they want to gather. And as soon as you introduce an idiot from IT in there <laughs> to, uh, to tell them what they want, things start going badly wrong. Um, but of course, well, actually I say of course, initially I was all for giving uh, clinicians a copy of Protégé, which is an open source ontology editor and letting, letting them get ri let rip on building their own models. And the experiment to do that at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital lasted less than a morning of uh, somebody's <laughs> MSc project. <laughs> so a three month project uh, after the first morning we concluded this would never be possible. Uh, so we built lots of tools to, 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 to do that. And again, this is XML to the rescue because you can build your tools in virtually anything. So we built them in open office. You could have presumably done it in Microsoft Office um, and various graphing packages, a thing called YED, which will draw nice graphs. Um, even mind mapping software you can use and then save down as XML. And then you can transform these people's models back into an ontology and it's a lot less painful for them to do that. Um, and through that process, uh, out pops their clinical information system, which does all sorts of nice things. And I've been toying with the idea of signing up for a demo <laughs> later that I might, I might or might not. Uh, so there it goes. Um, so that's in, uh, at the moment in five NHS hospitals and is starting fairly majorly to roll out. So we just got some little bit of money from the University in Oxford to help roll out to over 100 uh, sites in the UK and, out and, uh, and abroad over the next four to five years. So that will be quite good. Um, but here we have reached the point where, but will it scale up in the sort of same way that uh, case notes was able to, to scale up using a relational database and armies of systems integrators. So inside City EHR, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but inside City EHR, there's a feature to generate test data where you create, you, know, you take a real live record of somebody. Um, we've got some, actually, it's not quite real life real life data for somebody called Timothy Abernathy, who as far as I know doesn't exist. Um, and uh, Timothy Abernathy's record is loaded in and then you can dial in uh, what sort of test data you want. So how many records, um, what age ranges, um, uh, or the split between male and female record, a few other things that, that can be uh, adjusted. And you press the button and it goes building, loading the database. Um, so we use that feature to generate some different sizes of database. And uh, here we went. Um, 
And the good news was that uh, we started with a database which was uh, with nothing in it. Uh, so uh, empty exists database. It's about 80 megabytes on disk. Um, and uh, the record that we used as a template was about one and a half megabytes in XML on disk. And as you load thousands into the database, uh, there's virtually no database uh, bloat. I'm not quite sure why there's virtually no database bloat for disk, but, uh, but that's, that's quite good. And actually, in my experience, far better than uh, putting XML into relational databases. Um, the, well, as you get up, the, okay, so this um, graph showing uh, the, the dark gray up there is the database size, and this line here is the equivalent size of that XML just held on disk. And so the actual bloat is the difference between them, which is very small. Um, so... Um, so which, which, which is, I think, I don't know why that is. I mean, I'll come back to this in conclusions, actually. A, a, f a fair number of things I say might sound a bit, um, what's the polite word, naive. I was going to say idiotic, but I shan't call myself an idiot. But the, 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 uh, I, I don't know why that is, and I haven't investigated why that is, but it's pleasing. Right, okay. So uh, assuming we did that uh, and kept going, I was slightly constrained by having no funding for this. So um, in theory, uh, we could take uh, that, if we could extrapolate that, a million patients would be one and a half terabytes. Um, so I've uh, at my disposal got only a couple of terabytes overall. So I can't get up to that, that stage um, yet. But, um, but, 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 but so these results are up to 20,000 patients. Um, so as we load those in, we're indexing them in exist, and this is what the index uh, configuration looks like. And we're using just a couple of indexes. So there's a full text index, which is based on Lucene, uh, which is Lucene, Apache Lucene, which is here. Uh, and we've got full text on uh, index on just a couple of attributes, uh, the extension, one, one called extension and one called value, which are there. And then uh, separately to that, we've got what's called an exist range index. Um, and that's where we're looking for uh, just for equality between values of, um, uh, or, or, or sorry, where we're, at, or where, we're, where we're running queries which are just using normal X query comparators rather than any um, full text query. On this, but th those, that range index is on the same two uh, attributes. Um, now, I didn't say this, but the, the HL7 CDA XML, which is what all these data are held in, is a typical design by committee with not very many XML or maybe even IT experts on the committee, and it's terrible. Um, however, like many such standards, it has been, it's the one that's used. So terrible though it is, I was being a bit rude to it. I mean, I'm sure it's very clever, but from, a, from an information engineering point of view, it's got some serious deficiencies. So when you look at the HL7 CDA XML, you think, oh no, what's going on here? And um, you end up with masses of XML to represent not very much data. But the good news is that all the interesting things are held in fairly standard ways. So the indexes uh, are only on a couple of uh, attributes. I say the good news is from configuring the indexes, that's good news. However, from from a data retrieval point of view, it's probably not such a good news because your indexes uh, get pretty big. Um, as in, you don't have a lot of differentiation between, you know, you've only got four indexes in there and they're basically on the same two attributes. So, uh, so anyway, that's where we are with the XML. We can't do anything about that. If we're running the uh, city EHR uh, as a user, then we use the querying, or clinicians use the querying, to build up cohorts 
of patients, and I'm sure you can't see what they're doing there, but they build up separate queries which will run against the database. So that's looking bottom one there, I'll read out, is people who have, have a current fracture, which is a right neck of femur. There are 73. Uh, this one is left neck of femur, so these are hip fractures. Um, and as, as, as we go up, and then here we have uh, people who are currently still on bone specific treatment, 350, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you can start to combine those cohorts and get people who are hip fractures on bone specific therapy who are assessed in the month of January and combine them together. So that's how a clinician uses the querying. Uh, for our purposes and how does the database scale, we're not really interested in doing that. We just want to issue some X queries to the database. So there's a separately for administrators, something where we can run any X query. But that interface that I showed you is basically building up X queries, which because of the regular structure of the XML, whatever, whatever clinical observations you're looking for, you end up with a query, which is almost always of this form. Um, so we're looking of for uh, CD, uh, well, value elements in the, CD, in the CDA namespace uh, with a particular value. And here we're using, we didn't need to, but for this, for the purpose of this to exercise the full text query, we're looking for a full text uh, match on the value of female. Uh, in an element, uh, which is gender, in an entry, which is gender, and in the, uh, in the XML for the clinical data, the lowest safe clinical context is uh, called an entry. So all the data are in an entry element. And the, uh, what we want to return are which patients these belong to. So we have to go back up to the, uh, to the root clinical document and find the uh, identifier of the patient when we get those matches. So, they, so that's the sort of query that we're running always, all the time. So all our experiments are running is actually using exactly that uh, query. And then we work out how many hits and how long it took. So what happens? A uh, slight confession here is a bit of a typo in the legend on this um, diagram, which I've preserved in these slides. Uh, partly because I didn't have time to change it, and partly just so I could point out if you happen to read the proceedings. But this uh, is what's happening to our query time as we ramp up from one to 20,000 patients. If we start at the bottom, the number of hits is going up. When we've got one patient, we've got one hit, and when we've got 20,000 patients, we've got approximately 10,000 hits. So about half of them are, uh, we're looking for female patients, about half of them are female. Um, and our uh, response, uh, uh, sorry, our, our, our time for the first query to exist uh, goes up more or less linearly with the number of, of hits, not quite, but more or less. So uh, we're taking 0.6 of a second for one patient, and in fact, you'll see um, until we get to 100 patients, it's all just overhead. So, so then up to 100 patients actually no effect really significantly on the, on the execution time of the queries. Um, when we get to 20,000 patients, we're taking just under seven seconds for those for the first query. Uh, if you run the query again, the, the, the execution time is considerably less uh, due to the caching of the indexes. However, uh, if you run an almost identical query, then, for, again, for a reason which I don't understand, uh, the cache isn't used. So if I change male to female, or if I, for, sorry, female to male, then I'm back to the first search time, even if I've just run. So I'm not sure quite what's going on there. So all our results we based on the first query time, uh, which is when we get to 20,000 patients, is about three times as long as the... That's the repeat query time. Okay, but that's not bad, in my opinion, for doing that. However, oh, sorry, there's one other thing I should say there. 
uh, all the measurements of timings are taken out of the XForms interface from the time of submission of the query to the database to the time that the results are available back in XQuery in a sorry, in XForms, in an XForms instance that we can do something with. Um, and one, one interesting piece of work would just be to look at the database queries all on their own, which I would imagine are considerably less than this. I don't know how much less, but it would be quite a lot less. Um, but from our point of view, there's no point doing the query unless we can actually do something with the results. Um, so, but just ramping up like that is not going to get us up to the required millions of patients. So we went to a federated database search. So taking nodes of, uh, of patients, maybe 20,000, 100,000, whatever, uh, putting them all on separate database instances, farming out separate queries, and then aggregating the results. So we did that just as an experiment on how to do this with nodes of 1,000 patients, so very small. And the first thing we did was we set up five databases and run each one individually from the same hub just to make sure they're all working and those are the results there which are sort of more or less the same what we're expecting. Um, and then we implemented the federated search using XML pipelines which is available in Orbion and uh, we aggregated, we basically used the pipeline to iterate through all our database instances and then aggregate the results uh, together and time that and the, and the Results of that were disastrous, <laughs> okay, <laughs> which was I was very disappointed with because I thought that was the way which would work. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so putting five nodes together, I mean, even with one node, which is taking half a second on its own, when you aggregate one node through a pipeline, it takes six seconds. <laughs> so, if you aggregate five nodes through the pipeline, it takes 30 seconds. So, uh, uh, pretty sure we weren't doing anything fundamentally wrong, so that approach is struck off uh, fairly immediately. Uh, the way I didn't think would work initially was the way that it was this way, which was to do the iteration inside X forms. And the reason I didn't think it would work is because the X forms 1.1 standard says that if you iterate or if you make a series of submissions, the submissions are asynchronous, so you, if you iterate through them, uh, you will go off and, and you say you far five in this way. It'll far off five and not wait for the first one to come back before the second one is fired off. However, Orbion, the version that I was using, doesn't do that. It fires them off synchronously. So I was expecting uh, that if one node took uh, far, uh, half a second, that five nodes would take one and a half seconds. Yes, but I'm using Orbion 3.9 Community Edition, oh, which is uh, from my three, four years ago, for reasons which I won't explain because I've run out of time, but I am. Uh, so, uh, so Orbion claim that it's not making uh, asynchronous submissions, but I suspect it probably is, even though they claim it's not, um, because, because basically the results are better for the five than five in a row, including the overhead of doing the aggregation. So that's quite promising. So uh, almost finished. <laughs> uh, so uh, what can we do then? Is this feasible? Well, my conclusion is that it is feasible to do. Uh, it's not feasible. If we take the top there, we, if we took 100K nodes and extrapolated up, we'd end up with a query for 55 million patients taking five and a half hours. Now, that sounds ridiculous, but actually, uh, for detailed search in big data, for research purposes, on, you know, in, a, in a, what I would call a noddy approach to doing it, that's actually probably not, not bad. So with a starting point of five and a half hours, you could probably get that down quite considerably uh, and that's in a fairly, with a fairly naive approach. So I think that's uh, actually feasible, or certainly not, not out of the ballpark. And particularly since I can't find anywhere 
any uh, data on what's an acceptable sort of search time in a big data set because a lot of searches on big data are not the actual full searches. You start to throw away things and guess and etc to get the, the, the times down. Um, what we're actually looking at is actually not 100k nodes but 20k nodes. I can run five 20k nodes even on that machine uh, here. Uh, and on a slightly better machine, I can, on a thousand pounds worth of hardware, I can run a, 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 an aggregated 100K node and get six seconds out of it. Um, and if you ramp that up, that's actually pretty reasonable. Uh, and what we started looking at for nodes is whether we can run them on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so uh, exist on a Raspberry Pi 2. It's only got 512 meg of RAM. Raspberry Pi 3 has got one gig of RAM, and apparently you can solder more RAM on the top. If you're not supposed to, but you can. Uh, that's the limitation. If you get a one, a, another single board computer, gigabyte bricks, you get eight gig of RAM and a quad-core processor for under 100 pounds. I could run a 100K node on that. So I'm basically looking at point less than a P, less than a P per patient. Uh, doing it this way versus five pounds a patient <laughs> doing it the, the NHS national program way. So that was my, con my conclusion is that it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, John. I also like the sound of uh, loads of Raspberry Pis on the go with RAM much, soldiered on the top, you know. I wonder how much heat they generate. You just put a fan, like a room fan, to keep, <laughs> to keep them cool. <laughs> so how big was the team building this system? Uh, the team, this is it. Just yes. one Yes. There's quite a lot of interesting things about that, because that... You kept saying we. Oh uh, yeah, well I said there, there's uh, me and a few hangers on, but this experiment was, was me. The that original system I showed you, we invested maybe in dollars about ten million dollars, and we had at, at the peak we had about seventy people working on that on that system as a product, and I've recreated something not entirely alone, but but equivalent of probably a person per year in, in, in five years, something which does more, and we'll see whether it scales. And that's purely down to, well, A, second time around, it's a bit easier, but the fact that you can glue technology together now, a lot of the stuff which 10 or 15 years ago you had to build yourself, you just get some open source component and glue it together and off it goes. So. Do we have any other questions? Adam? The, um, you're, you're right. Actually, most of the queries, most of the queries that we're running, I'd say about 75% of them would use the range index rather than the Lucene index. It's only, uh, it's, it's, it's actually, when you're, when you're searching for patients in real, you know, like to find a patient, then you're more likely to use the full text index. I'm looking for... Mr. Blor, I can't remember how his name ends, so I'll just put in a wild card. So most of them are using the range index. One of the things, thank you for asking, I, th I thought you'd ask a question, but one of the things which I've deliberately not done is try and do anything clever with the database, because I just want to see whether it's feasible. So there's no, been no optimizing <coughs> other than sen you know, sensible setup, with the right amounts of memory and things. There's been no optima and and, and Posing sensible queries, but there's been no optimizing of the indexes, um, and there's been no database specific features used other than sort of it's just out of the box. And I, and I did that mainly because I wanted to show it was feasible without trying to do anything, you know, it's feasible the dumb way, if you like, without doing anything uh, too sophisticated. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, John.